Good morning and thank you for being with us. In just three short days, the first public schools in Connecticut will open and a new school year will begin. We're going to spend the next 30 minutes learning about what's happening in our schools and addressing the challenges of anxiety and depression in teens and how we can support them. We begin with Kate Diaz. She's the president of the Connecticut Education Association, also a high school teacher in Manchester. Kate, thanks for being with us. It's my pleasure. I always love back to school. Well, it's it's that time of year for sure. As we said, only a couple of days for many of these districts to head back. So I guess my first question, you know, you're in touch with all these members of CEA across the state. Where do we stand as we head back to class? So teachers are optimistic. This is our like peak optimism time where we're really excited, enthusiastic. We're looking forward to greeting our students. We're setting up our classrooms, fresh markers, new pencils, the whole nine yards. And so we're really excited. Um, obviously, there's a little apprehension with the teacher shortage, trying to figure out how many openings there will be. Uh, we're navigating the road of how we fill those spots. How do we take, you know, and move around teachers that we currently have, ask them to take on additional course loads. So there is that little bit of anxiety and, you know, we, we have to temper that with our enthusiasm and understand that we're ready for all the challenges. Well, let's talk about some of those challenges. I know the teacher, teacher shortage and vacancies, both for teachers, paras, all sorts of people in the classroom right. because it affects those teachers if they don't have the support staff. What are you hearing from the front lines? I, I saw a quote from you at one point at the end of last school year, you were looking at maybe 1,700. Where are we on vacancies across the state? So we haven't heard a huge shift. So we haven't done the fall audit. That'll happen in September after really we settle into the school year a little bit. It. Uh, but we're not hearing that there's huge shifts, that there's any great surge of people coming in. So we're concerned that the vacancy rate will probably be consistent with last year. What we do know is there have been some budget shifts, some changes that have caused a reduction in staff in several areas. And that's obviously problematic in its own right. Um, but it does move teachers from one district to another and things like that. So we'll have a better feel for it um, in the coming weeks. But truthfully, I don't think there's a huge shift uh, in what we're expecting. And if there's no huge shift, we saw some districts last year having days where they'd have early dismissals because of lack right. of staff. Is that something you expect teachers will be contending with and districts will be contending with going into this school year? I hope not, but I wouldn't be surprised if it happened. And how about things we've seen in other places? I mean, around the country, we've heard of districts having to go to four day weeks because they can't retain staff. Uh, what, what do you make of these sort of innovative ideas? I don't know if that's the right word, but different ideas mm -hmm. to try to keep the train chugging down the tracks. So I'm not opposed. I think being innovative is timely right now. I think we do need to look at our workforce of educators and say, what are your needs? How do we meet them? So that we encourage and draw people in. We have to recognize that the workforce in general is highly competitive. And teachers are very skilled, highly educated, and really can shift and move into other areas quite successfully. So to keep them and retain them into the workforce of education, we may have to look at how do we be creative and innovative and really what are the benefits to our students when we do that as well. And so I think there's opportunity amid all of sort of the, the crunch that we're in if we're willing to embrace it. And I think some of those things, like we said, in other places, we've seen four day work weeks, we've seen other innovative ideas. Well, the story as old as time is just paying more money, right? So that's, <laughs> yeah. you know, and Absolutely. you're, you're yeah. in the union, so you're not going <laughs> to tell me that's a lousy idea. But that's something that was considered at the General Assembly, a minimum salary. It did not pass. Is that a big component of it? Because some of the complaints we've heard just sound like it's tough working conditions, you know, because of changes. You, do you throw money at the problem? Is that the move? Well, I think it's a two-part thing. I actually don't think it's as simple as just get more money in there and you're done. But I do think money matters because money allows us to work one job instead of two. You know, when you start talking about starting salaries in the 40,000s, they're just not competitive. In fact, I don't know where you live in Connecticut get, making a salary of 40,000 by yourself as an independent adult. So what we need to recognize is that when we look at educators, these are individuals we're asking to have a master's degree with a high level of responsibility for children, other people's children. And we need to value that in the same way that we would any other professional who's had to seek, access, you know, kind of this high level of education and responsibility and pay them accordingly. If you were an engineer, you would never start at forty, you know, thousand dollars. You'd be starting at sixty, sixty-five. So when we talked about the starting salary of sixty, it wasn't pulled out of the air. It was really looking at competitive salaries across the state for professionals and saying, what would you need to live as an independent adult here in the state of Connecticut? And that sixty thousand mark has actually been accepted across the country. We saw Maryland adopt a sixty thousand dollar starting salary. Delaware is in discussions about it. 
So it's a real common thread throughout all of the country, and Connecticut can afford to and should embrace that because, honestly, things like that make big statements to educators across the country. And um, you know what? Maybe at, encourage them to cross town, um, you know, state lines to come work here in Connecticut. You uh, did a survey, or CEA did a survey, mm -hmm. or commissioned a survey last fall looking at, you know, just where things stand with teachers. Right. I know there were some kind of alarming numbers, three quarters of teachers thinking about maybe leaving the profession. Where do things stand now as you talk to your colleagues and other union members? Where are they? It's optimistic, head back to school time, but still a tough gig. It's still really difficult, and I think there's several factors that are lingering. One is teachers were the only frontline employees and frontline workers that weren't recognized in the pandemic. We got a pat on the back and a you know good good job but there was no compensation or understanding for the excessive amount of work that that was um, unlike some of our other counterparts so that is lingering in the back of our teachers minds that really is there gratitude for the work that we're doing and the sacrifices that we make so I think that's a piece of it I think that as we kind of head back um, there's looking at the whole scope of the issues of that we're facing. Are, is there mental health supports for our students? Do we have the supports administratively that we need to do our jobs and be successful? Are class sizes appropriate? Um, are we really creating curriculum that allow us to be innovative, creative, and you know excited about the work we do? So as we kind of have these conversations, teachers um, I think are in a status quo, and we're going to reissue that survey and go about doing and, and checking with our members soon and we'll know exactly where they're at but it was alarming because it more than doubled the number of teachers who said you know what I'm thinking about leaving this profession prematurely so it's not that we're seeing an excessive retirement people kind of have this perception that there's this mass exodus of teachers at on one end but what we're really seeing is people reevaluating their work-life balance their work criteria and saying mm, i'm not sure education is measuring up so we've got some work to do internally we only have a few seconds left but I, we've been talking a lot about jobs and, and union issues and things like that a lot of parents are just watching kate saying i'm getting ready to send my kid back to school what do the teachers want from the parents give me 30 seconds oh the teachers just want communication with parents support communication open doors making sure that we're working together to serve children and Teachers are there to do that work, and we love our parents and are excited to work with them to really bring out the best in the kids. Well, like you said, it's, uh, it's back to school time. It's opening day. Every team can win the World Series on opening day, Kate. There's lots of optimism. You can head out there and, uh, and, and be excited to be back in those fresh classrooms. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you for being with us. Uh, we'll have you back, I'm sure.